I want to start by thanking uh, Jenny and Dairy Australia for the invitation to come here and uh, speak this morning. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about a topic that I've been interested in, in uh, for, for most of my research career, which is all about how do we, how do we process milk? How do we take a, a valuable raw material and convert it into safe uh, and desirable dairy products? And I've always been fascinated so, since a very early age by milk because uh, I, I just love the fact that most of what we've been able to do, most of what we've been, how we've been processing milk has almost been pre-science. It's been things we've known how to, in, in Ireland, we've been making butter and burying it in bogs for thousands of years. Every now and again, archaeologists find butter uh, containers buried in bogs around the country. We've been making cheese, we've been fermenting milk, we've been heating milk. Uh, and, you know, we've we've literally been catching up on the art of dairy with science for decades and now looking to the future and thinking about, okay, in the future, what are we going to be doing? What are consumers going to be demanding and expecting? And of course, what will food companies be producing and how will they make it? So what I've been interested in is, is what's the future uh, potential of dairy. What are the challenges that we still need to overcome? What are the, the what are the opportunities that are there? So you know what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about some of those. You know, and lots of different things could affect developments in food. And I find this fascinating. You know, we'll talk about kind of three main, two main technologies today, and and touch on a couple of others, but the main two we'll talk about are probably going to be high pressure and 3D printing. But and you will see, for example, the role of consumers when it comes to 3D printing, about you know, demands for personalization, demands for uh, personalized nutrition for convenience could drive the, the emergence of technology. We can see how drivers could be like uh, every now and again in Ireland, I'm sure in Australia, a report will come out say, for example, saying, you know, uh, oh, Irish consumers are consuming too much salt. Therefore, everybody who's producing a, a product of salt and that has to re-engineer their product. It's a, another driver. You know, new ingredients. I always think dairy is a great example. How whey. I know one of your uh, a famous Australian dairy scientist, uh, Jess Mellers, will always talk. I always remember his line about whey being from gutter to gold. You know, from problem to resource. From, you know, a disposal problem to a huge opportunity in terms of all the, the wealth of products that have come out of it. Specific demands. I always one of the fascinating things I think about food processing is it, it, some of the biggest drivers for it over the centuries have been things like war and exploration. How can we uh, stabilize food products for extreme environments? Whether it's for you know transporting it across the sea or feeding Napoleon's armies or NASA trying to bring food into space. Um, you know. I think we've seen, I'm sure it's been an, an issue in Australia as much as it was in, in Ireland in, in the last 20 years or so. Lots of discussion around Mycobacterium avium subspecies, paratuberculosis, uh, the, the possible causative agent of, of um, Crohn's disease, and whether it was inactivated by pasteurization, which I think provided a, a really salutary lesson, you know, that we can never think of. I always think if you'd asked food scientists what, what technology we really, really understand and really have a good handle on it would have been pasteurization. But yet that came along to say, well, maybe there's, there's things out there we still don't understand and we should never be complacent. We should never think we know it all. Uh, and then, you know, new technologies will come along and we'll talk about it, as they say, high pressure processing and 3D printing. You know, so uh, over the years, uh, and family of uh, new technologies have come along that I'm going to talk about, uh, many of which are of interest because they're non-thermal. And we'll talk about the, the advantages. I mean, we've relied traditionally. I mean, milk is a highly perishable raw material. It's, it's you know, it's it's a very nutritious base for microbial growth. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of barriers to growth in that it's got neutral pH. Uh, so, you know, to make it safe, to make it last, to give it even a, a, a minimal shelf life, we need to process it. And we've traditionally done that by heat. But of course, the thing about heat is while it's very effective against, you know, microbes, which is the main reason we apply it, it's always like kind of hitting food with a blunt hammer. It's a blunt instrument. And we always have to make trade-offs because the more we heat, the more we're going to make our products safe, the more we're going to make it last longer. But we have to accept that we change milk. We change nutritional quality, change sensory quality. You know, so the ultimate is, is you know, we could compare pasteurized and UHT milk and we think like pasteurized milk is, is is very popular in Ireland. We could say it's a very flawed product in many ways because it needs to be maintained in a cold chain, it needs to be kept refrigerated. 
and uh, it goes off in, you know, two to three weeks. So, you know, is there a solution? Is there a way we can make pasteurized milk better? Yes, it's easy. We UHT treat it. And, you know, to me, as, as a scientist, it, it seems, you know, UHT, it, it's it's the perfect solution because it's, the product is, is or at least should be completely safe. It's got a, a hugely long shelf life and we don't need to keep it in the fridge. So we've we've just undone all the disadvantages of pasteurization. But we get it's a different change. And a perceived, probably perceived more than real nutritional uh, deterioration. And for so for that reason, alone, consumers in many countries like Ireland are just going to reject UHT milk just on the basis of flavor. So, you know, so heat is a blunt instrument. So the idea there's this kind of mythical holy grail for so many food products has been, what if we could do what we want to do, what we want to achieve with heat, which is to, to get safety and get stability, without the disadvantages to sensory and nutritional quality. And so that's been the kind of driver, particularly for high pressure, as we'll talk about. So, you know, uh, so to give us fresher products, you know, with minimal processing, this idea that the product is as unchanged from its kind of original fresh state as possible. Uh, and obviously, as we, uh, you know, ideally at a reasonable cost, as, as we'll see, this is always going to be a challenge. So, you know, I'm going to, to just mention briefly that, that obviously heat, you know, while we say that heat has been one of the, our kind of backbone technologies for dairy, like obviously we haven't kind of, uh, clearly haven't abandoned heat or anything like it, but there's a lot of research going on about how could we make heat better? How could we use different types of heat, whether it be radio frequency or electrically based, like ohmic heating or induction heating or, or new forms of UHT or... or even microwaves. So just to mention briefly, you know, that, that there is a lot of research on, okay, can we take the, the, the if you like, the well-established principle of heat and do it better? Uh, and in particular, I think the key here is always going to be, uh, you know, the, 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 the secret to thermal processing is we want hotter rather than longer because uh, the, the, the key to inactivating bacteria is to reach the highest temperatures possible. The key or the main factor that will cause the, the undesirable changes is longer heat treatments. So we always want to try and see if we can maximize the temperature while minimizing the time. You know, so to, to increase our microbiological kill without le with less chemical and nutritional damage. So uh, and you know, with other process related improvements like reducing burn on and getting more consistent heating, uh, you know, and and trying to have more efficient processes. And there have been processes like ISI. Uh, new generations of UHT processes, uh, which are giving us uh, very high temperatures for very short times. I mean, when I think of UHT, I guess a lot of people would think you'd be thinking classical treatments of two, three, four seconds and maybe 130, 140 degrees. But we're now looking at new generations of, of processes where you're going up to 250 to 200 degrees for fractions of a second, essentially no holding time, like injecting steam in at extremely high uh, pressures and temperatures and immediately flashing off the steam to get evaporative cooling. You know, so um, uh, more expensive, but some of the data here from a study about a decade ago showing like ISI, the innovative steam injection process, reaching temperatures up to 180 degrees and giving a good reduction of, of spore formers of, of some of our key thermophilic bacteria that might be present. But if we use kind of denaturation of whey proteins in kind of the middle column here as a kind of a proxy for um, uh, you know, chemical changes and a fairly good indicator of uh, the extent of chemical changes in the milk, we can see compared to indirect and direct UHT uh, a lot less changes while getting the same microbiological effects. So just an example. Another area I find quite fascinating in recent years has been microwaves because, you know, microwaves is a funny one because we're so used to it in, in a domestic environment, but it's one that we, we rarely think of at a, at a large scale in an industrial environment. But there are lots of, of studies going on and, and work going on uh, that, that's been particularly a research level, but starting to break through to, to, to pilot plant and to, to uh, probably moving towards commercial systems. I'm looking at using microwaves and the advantage of microwaves for um, 
for high temperature process like UHD is is obviously the absence of hot surfaces because the, the 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 there's there's no metal surfaces needless to say and the heat is generated uniformly and, and throughout the product so we don't get burn on we don't get a lot of the other issues to do with fouling etc we might worry about otherwise in UHD. so i think microwaves is another area which which is interesting to watch but again you know my main focus on this part of the presentation is a non-thermal and like over the years, and, and for many of these, the high pressure and pulsed electric fields, for example, have been studied for nearly 100 years. The first report in high pressure was by an American called Bert Height, working at the West Virginia Agriculture Station in 1890s, who said the products could be could be stabilized by subjecting them to very high pressures. And a guy in 1910 called Percy Bridgman showed that if you put an egg under pressure, it came up basically solidified, although temperature hadn't increased. You cooked it using pressure, which was showing that that pressure could denature proteins. So some of these have been around for quite a long time, uh, at at least the knowledge. And, you know, lots of others, if we look at families of, of non-thermal, like ultrasound, ultraviolet light, magnetic fields, light pulses, irradiation, obviously, maybe as a really novel, it's been around for a long time, but certainly in Europe is, is very little used. I always think it's one of the most powerful technologies that we have that we keep in the drawer, as it were, at least in, in, in a lot of European countries. And again, it just shows the power, which I've touched on earlier, of consumer views. And consumer views on irradiation means sufficiently negative that, that it's just one that, that, that most food companies don't uh, are, are reluctant to touch. So, you know, if we look at like the drivers, and just to give an illustration, a lot of kind of the early applications of technologies like high pressure and post electric fields were around fruit juices or smoothies, right? Because the problem is heat labor on nutritional and sensory characteristics, right? So products that are associated with a very strong, fresh flavor and a lot of nutrients, vitamin C, etc., uh, but a short term process shelf life due to microbial spoilage. Now, usually a uh, uh, safety risk associated with these products but a shelf life issue due to acid tolerant bacteria yeast and mold so the solution is to use technologies like high pressure pulse electric fields to get the inactivation while retaining fresh light characteristics so this is the kind of the advantage or the desire behind a lot of high pressure processes has been to to uh, give us something which is the best of all worlds it's got the best characteristics of the heat treated with the best characteristics of the raw so it's got the, the stability of the and the, the microbiological quality he treated, but the sensory nutritional quality of the raw. So you know this uh, an, an example of a technology before I get on to high pressure here is pulsed electric fields, which is using high intensity pulses, rapid pulses of electricity, uh, being applied to solid foods or foods flowing in some kind of chamber through a membrane to basically punch holes in bacterial cell walls. Uh, and it has been commercialized for fruit juices. There are a number of of products that the first company was in the US, a company called Genesis Juice, that was uh, using uh, electricity to basically um, uh, process fruit juices. Again, this is a technology, the first report, there was a process called the ElectroPure process report in the 1920s of using electricity to process milk. You know, and there's been quite a bit of work uh, gone on in microbial inactivation shelf life. Here's an example of a study uh, with pulsed electric fields. So again, a, a lot of these, like, technologies the early studies and the early commercial successes might have been on things like fruit juices but when it comes to milk milk is a much more complex medium in many ways so there's a lot typically it's it's often um i always thought when i worked in, and still work in high pressure it was kind of fascinating because for decades or for for a long time like does a huge scientific literature on on high pressure processing of milk much of it coming from from uh a number of groups, including my own in Cork, studying the fundamentals of what it does to a dairy system. But that wasn't being reflected in dairy products on the market because there was a much longer lead time to understanding what it actually does to the raw material before that was commercialized. And maybe the same for pulsed electric fields. Like here's a study where milk was being subjected in a number of different um, uh, routes to in combination with microfiltration or heat treatment to see how it might fit into a dairy process. And I just draw on some of a lot of data here and the slides will be available afterwards and, and the references are on the slides for those who'd like to, to look for, for more information. But I think, you know, it was quite notable here that the uh, pulsed electric fields, um, if you compare kind of microfiltration and, and thermal processing in the first uh, red box you know you can see the thermal processing was a conventional kind of a heat treatment up to 75 degrees and it was giving a reduction of bacterial count of 4.6 logs 
uh, 99.99% kill. You can see pulsed electric fields in the lower red box compared to microfiltration. Although the maximum temperature reached was, was a lot lower than thermal, it was never above 50. We could see we could even get up to, you know, we could, could match or greatly exceed the inactivation levels that were seen with the thermal process. So I think that was a nice kind of a, an illustration of the potential of, of, of pulsed electric fields. But there are lots of other. Here's a review article from New Zealand, uh, from uh, David Everett's group on uh, functional properties. And I'd like just showing again, a reminder, again, we won't go into details, but <coughs> the milk is a complex system. Milk is a very complex physical, chemical and protein lipid system. And, and sometimes these processes kind of unexpected consequences. And this is just an illustration of, you know, looking at one aspect, which is the milk fat lobule membrane, which we know in, in raw milk is a very particular biological base structure. After homogenization, when we've increased the size of the fat lobules, uh, sorry, increased the number of fat lobules and decreased their size, we've increased the surface area. So that becomes stabilized by binding protein like the casing. But in post electric fields, we can see that there's a different type of membrane that builds up and you get a different kind of a structure um, um, based on the, on the, the surface of the milfat lobule membrane which could have downstream processing consequences which could be positive could be negative but it's just showing again you know the milk we can never forget how complex milk is and that that's why as i mentioned like there's a huge literature on many of these because we really need to understand if we start doing unusual things to milk what are the consequences uh, and there is a company uh, called Elia, uh, in Europe at least, who are producing a uh, commercial uh, bus electric fields unit. And they have a system on their, their website, which I find fascinating, called Cool Dairy, for up to 10,000 litres an hour for pulsed electric field uh, uh, treatment of milk. You can see better shelf life, preserved nutritional value. You know, so they're talking about spore control, improved quality, increased shelf life. Uh, so there are uh, commercial systems uh, on the market, which claim to be uh, of interest for, for PEF treatment, pulsed electric field treatment. So just for the next couple of minutes, we'll, we'll talk about high pressure processing as a, a way of, of increasing shelf life and preserving quality, probably compared to pulsed electric fields and much more established now technology. I mean, it, it really emerged out of uh, I said 100 years ago there were the first reports, but the first commercial successes, I guess, were, weren't too far away, closer to, to, to Australia and to Ireland and Japan around the 1990s, from where, uh, you know, high pressure kind of emerged and then spread rapidly around the world. Uh, to increase shelf life, preserve quality, increase safety, usually as one hurdle. One of the advantages, of course, of, of fruit juice as, as a medium to work with is the acidity gives you a big hurdle to, to discourage microbial growth. Uh, we, unique advantages, uh, like oysters, uh, as we'll see, where it has the ability to shut the oysters, but it's expensive. And so, you know, nobody's going to get away from the fact that high pressure is a really expensive technology. Uh, and so the, the application that it's going to use for has to justify that cost. So there must be a unique advantage over an existing process, clear economic benefit and, and scale realism. I mean, that's, I hardly say like with high pressure, you know, if you try and sell the idea, whatever, but the, the machinery to a, to a food processor, it's like, okay, you know, what are the three things no food processor wants to hear? It's really expensive, it's batched and it's really small scale. You know, that's that, that's like the, 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 the trifecta of undesirable properties for technology. So these are, you know, uh, real questions that, that need to be considered. You know, but the principle for those who aren't familiar, and I guess uh, many people have come across this in one way or another, is uh, a force exerts pressure on a medium, which transmits pressure to the food product to be, to be treated. So the product is held in a chamber, and we are using pumps or pistons to, to, to uh, create pressure in the fluid which is surrounding the food. So food is typically packaged during this, okay? And it's being applied either so statically, which means it's being applied evenly and, and essentially instantaneously throughout the food. There's no, like, kind of gradient system might be with heat treatment. So if we kind of try and put that into context, if we picture, you know, where do we find high pressures on Earth? So we might picture going down to the bottom of the ocean, going to the deepest parts of the ocean, like the Marianas Trench. And there we get the pressure, which we tend to use units of megapascals, where the sea level has a pressure of atmospheric pressure of 0.1 megapascals. And so at the bottom of the sea, the deepest parts of the ocean, we might be at a thousand times that, 100 megapascals. 
right? So this is sea level. We go down to the bottom of the ocean. We're a thousand times that. High pressure processing for food is generally in, up around four, five, six hundred megapascals. So about four to six times the pressures we find in deepest parts of the ocean. So these are really, really high pressures that are not naturally found on Earth unless we were to tunnel somewhere towards the center of the Earth. Um, so, you know, the key operating variables, so, you know, you kind of, the, the, the chambers tend to be cylindrical. You get an idea of their, their kind of appearance and their scale here, you know, uh, with key operating variables being the pressure we, we hold, go to, the temperature. Typically, it's non-thermal, so we want to, to hold it at room temperature. The pressure itself increases temperature, but it's usually for a typical process it might go up transiently by about 10 degrees. Uh, the duration of treatment, it's a, largely a batch load unload process. So duration becomes a, a, a critical factor. Uh, and obviously we want to try and minimize the time so we can maximize the troop. Most processes, probably three to five minutes would be typical for commercial processes. And, you know, the two main kind of designs, although they're cylindrical, or you can see the two examples here of the, the, the horizontal one on the left and the vertical one on the right. So how does it keep the pressure from here? Like even pressure both inactivate vegetative bacteria, they both inactivate yeast and mold. They both, as we'll see, have, have difficulty in activating spores. I think the whole, you know, again, the key for any of these technologies is do they inactivate spore formers, uh, which do we know that to do with heat, we need to go to really high temperatures, whether it's in the UHD system or in canning. Uh, proteins can be denatured as Bridgman showed when he showed you could cook an egg. Enzymes can be inactivated, but it's the lower three parts of the, 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 the top box are even more near the flavor, nutrients appear. And so where heat can have negative effects, pressure generally has very little effect because pressure works on large three dimensional molecules like a protein. It unfolds it and it changes its shape. And if that's a critical uh, protein for a bacterium, it's going to kill that bacteria. If it's an enzyme, it's going to inactivate that enzyme. So it works on large three dimensional structures. Okay. Whereas most things that contribute uh, uh, flavor and nutritional qualities food don't have large three dimensional structures. They're small, simple molecules. So they're almost invisible to pressure. Because pressure isn't breaking the chemical bonds as heat does. And that's where the difference comes in. So the advantages should be, you know, it's minimal processing to give us a flesh, fresh uh, kind of character, good sensory nutritional retention. But the advantage are, you know, cost, disadvantages, cost scale, batch-wise, nature largely. And for some products, there's just not an obvious advantage, you know, to, to warrant the uh, the, the, the disadvantages. So, you know, breakthrough applications. I know in Australia, there's a lot of interest as elsewhere in shellfish to, to kill pathogens and opening shells, everything from mussels to oysters to um, uh, lobsters, even. You know. In many countries, it's become popular applications. Uh, ready to eat meals, guacamole was an early one to, to, to stabilize the green color uh, of, of avocado, uh, broccoli. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, of guacamole uh, extracted from avocados, uh, fruit juices and smoothies, which I've mentioned here before. I always love the lower left, I think it was from Portugal or Spain container, which, you know, it, they're an unusual shaped container and it always takes a few seconds to wonder, you know, why are they shaped like that? And then you realize that's a very clever solution to, a, a, to fitting packages. If you're treating a product in a package in a cylindrical system, having a kind of a wedge shaped um, uh, package gives you a better packing density, which I thought was very interesting. And in Ireland at the moment, like the main high pressure application that you can see is, is fruit juices and smoothies. And you can go into to, to supermarkets and petrol stations and find expensive, fancy designer smoothies with kale and broccoli and quinoa and God knows what else there. And they often say on the back, a term that's often being used is cold pressed, which sometimes means a technology for extracting the juice, but more and more commonly means it's been subjected to high pressure processing. So uh, the main thing, process parameters, as we said, the pressure, the time, and the temperature. So by and large, for most products for non-thermal pasteurization, you're talking about four to 600 megapascals for holding times of around five minutes. So, you know, it, I said early on, it, there was a kind of a gap. So I'll kind of just for the next couple of minutes, talk about uh, uh, dairy, a gap in the dairy market, as it were. And then the first product is actually this one here. The first company was a company in Spain called Rodia in the late 90s, or early 2000s, who launched. And it was a very interesting, simple example of a product for, for high pressure, which is, uh, it was cheese. And what they were doing was they were taking cheese and they were high pressure processing it to basically sterilize it, to 
because cheese, we know, is a very live product. It's full of harmless lactic acid bacteria, which might be starters and non-starters that are present. And that's fine, that's part of the cheese. But if you take the cheese and you add it into a deli meat or a sandwich, or you add it into another system, you're bringing in a high microbial load with it. And how do you get rid of that? And what Rodeo were doing was they were just using it to get rid of the microbial load in, in cheese before they added it into other products. And there are other kind of fresh cheeses that, that use the same, you know, and various kind of dairy fruit other hybrids again one of the big challenges as we've seen is, is spore formers so you know having an acid hurdle in there to, to control the spores is a big advantage so combining with with food with sorry with fruit or with vinegar and a yogurt system or something gives that advantage uh, with high pressure so a lot of the early products there but if we go back to milk itself like high pressure does there's been a huge kind of research interest in high pressure because it does a lot of things to, to milk that other technologies don't like it disrupts or aggregates the casein micelles, which are key protein component, 80% of protein in milk is in a form of these casein micelles. It changes the mineral profile. It denatures and causes association of whey proteins with casein micelles, but in a different way and to different extents than, than heat treatment might. It, it, some enzymes that are very heat resistant, very sensitive to vice versa, to, to pressure and vice versa. Uh, fat globules, we can see there's some interesting effects on fat globules. And again, microbial inactivation is pretty predictable for a kind of a neutral pH system. Again, I could talk in, 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 you know, we could have a talk alone on any of these properties, but uh, time doesn't permit. But if there are specific questions, I can take them at the end. But just to pick a few of the, the things, like, like here's a study from a former student of mine who's, I think, did this work in Massey, Trace Constantine's that with Fonterra, uh, you know, looking at high pressure processing and thermal processing on, on milk. And the key kind of sample here is sample D. And that skin milk has been treated with high pressure. And it's the disruption of the casein micelles has caused, and we can see it under a microscope, the disruption of these, these large kind of uh, protein aggregate structures that are unique to milk. This from one of my students a number of years ago, like as the pressure has disrupted it. And because there's much smaller size, they interact with milk less, sorry, with light less, and we get a much paler color. So we get a, a, a very pale, uh, and that's, we don't get that if you, Pulsed electrophy on street milk, you don't get if you heat, if you filter it, if you do anything. So, like one of the most basic building blocks of milk, which is 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 the casein my cell was fundamentally affected by pressure. So that led to a huge interest in well, what do we do with that knowledge? What do we do with that phenomenon? So um you know, that led to many possible kind of molds. We could take milk and we could high pressure treat it and make liquid market milk and see what was its safety, stability, spoilage, and sensory. And it was funny, like I worked in this for a number of years in the 2000s. And my answer when I got to this point would always have been, and it's not an interesting, it's not going to replace pasteurization. And, you know, so that was, you know, more or less, let's leave that aside. And but what I didn't expect, maybe because I didn't think deeply enough about it, was the question wasn't could it replace pasteurization? The question was could it replace raw? And we'll come back to that point in a minute, okay? Because that's been a really interesting story, including in, in particular in Australia. You know, another thing is then we could take high pressure and we can make pro subject to milk to high pressure and, and make products, make ice cream, make cheese, and see how do these changes in the proteins cause changes in the, in the ripening or the, the coagulation properties of the milk. And they do. And again, there's lots of studies. We've published lots of work in this. You know, we don't have time to get into it today. What would it do to sound to, to yogurt? Or, you know, if we make ingredients like caseins or milk protein concentrates, what would their properties be? And ingredients is an area that, that's hugely, I think, underlooked in this regard. We're doing some work on it at the moment in Cork. Ice cream. I remember we high pressure processed ice cream that uh, mix, and we found a huge increase in thickness and viscosity of it. And I remember thinking, God. And we had a world ice cream expert, Professor Doug Goff from Canada, on sabbatical in Cork at the time. And he was just amazed at what high pressure did to ice cream mix. That we got such an increase in in the body of the, the ice cream, and we thought, Oh, maybe we'll patent this. And then the first thing you do, of course, is you you search and you find has anybody else painted? And we found that one of the largest producers of ice cream in the world, which was Unilever. Had a whole library of patents and high pressure processing and ice cream mix. So we realized you were the first people to figure this out and, and we published a paper on it instead. Um, and then uh, the other option, of course, is to take the milk and make it into dairy products. 
like in so, so if you think about cheese, you can apply it in two different ways. You could process the milk and then make cheese, or you could make the cheese and then process the cheese. Uh, so, and I'll touch on this in a second, you know, it's impact or in yogurt, or again, instead of making ingredients from high pressure processed milk, what if you made the ingredients and then high pressure processed milk? So, you know, there's a lot of ways you could kind of superimpose high pressure into dairy kind of a product uh, portfolio, lots of different points at which it could, could be tested. And there's been a lot of studies, there's a lots of gaps in our knowledge, but I'll, I'll just over the next couple of minutes kind of touch on a few of the, the interesting ones. Like one interesting observation we did early on was that, again, with my student Tom Huppert at the time, who's now a professor of dairy science at Agoning and works for Fries on Campina. I think he was one of your speakers here, Jenny, in, in the seminar series in, in recent tweets. Uh, if one of the studies he did was when we high pressure processed whole milk, we discovered it, it just, or we noticed that it just wasn't creaming as fast. And we discovered that, that like you can see here, at treating at low pressures like 200 megapascals increased the volume of the cream layer produced uh, after a certain period of storage, but higher pressures basically reduce the volume of cream produced. And eventually it does cream, but it very much slowed it down. And we, we, you know, we think, okay, how do we conventionally reduce creaming? We homogenize it, which by reducing the size of the fat globules. So we looked under a microscope and there's no effect in the size of the fat globules, which is mystifying. And we have to go back to papers from the 1940s to realize that, that the fat globules don't rise. You know, we conventionally think just fat globules and they rise to the surface to give us a cream layer. But we discovered that they don't actually rise individually. They cluster together. They stick together with proteins on their surface. They actually work better at low temperatures, and then they rise as clusters. And what high pressure was doing was it was interfering with this clustering mechanism. So it was uh, interfering with the, the first stage of cream. So uh, again, an example, a lovely example of one of the unexpected consequences of pressure treatment. Like cheese, I remember the first time I heard of pressure was an Indian student who's, who was in Australia, actually, Tanaj Singh, working for CSIRO. Uh, uh, I think he's still there now. Um, he, him telling me that there was um, a patent from Japan that said if you took cheese and you high pressure treated it for three days, it would, if you took fresh cheddar curd, you get a, a flavor equivalent six month old cheddar. And he said, that sounds a bit crazy that sounds a bit unbelievable that you could reduce cheese ripening from three to six months to three days using pressure and one of the first studies i did uh with colleagues in chagas the, the, uh, the irish equivalent of csi or if you like was to, to investigate this and we discovered yes it was pretty crazy it, it didn't work uh, like the patent claimed but we went on to say, okay, it does accelerate. We looked trying to optimize it because three days pressure treatment isn't a very feasible process anyway. We looked at, you know, can we optimize it? We could accelerate cheese ripening, but nowhere near enough to be um, commercially interesting. So we thought, okay, what else could we do? Could we decelerate cheese ripening? So we looked at uh, high pressure treating, like what if you took a fast ripening cheese, you know, with a kind of a window of perfect quality that after which it kind of becomes overripe and kind of stop it at that point. So you get a longer shelf life at optimal quality by inactivating the microbes and enzymes to cause the ripening. So we did it for camembert and it worked perfectly. With one disadvantage, which was um, it did kill the mold on the surface. And so the white fluffy surface of the camembert became gray. So it was great technology, if ever it doesn't market for gray camembert uh, with the high pressure will have a huge potential. But uh, it was less a less obvious visual change was was blue cheese, as I've lower right here, uh, where the mold is internal. And we found to greatly extend the, the shelf life of blue cheese by high pressure processing. Um, and we also did a lot of work uh, on the high pressure processing of fresh mozzarella curd and found definitely that you can accelerate the development of desirable the hydration of the curd that gives you of the casein and the curd that gives you uh, the desirable stretching and melting properties of, of mozzarella. Uh, so, uh, and then it leads us to kind of, you know, something I've been absolutely fascinated, which is the, the idea of going back to, to milk processing. And the news from Australia a couple of years ago that you could have um, um, cold pressed raw milk uh, processed by made by cow, which uh, 
uh, was basically uh, cleared by the Australian regulatory authorities as being safe to drink. And I found this, uh, as somebody who'd worked in my brush for nearly 20 years at this point, I found this, I was like, yes, somebody's finally, finally done this and proved this to us. To be fair, a, a company um, in, in Mexico, I think, who had been the first to report, that there have been reports uh, of uh, Villa, something or other, uh, a company of high pressure processed straw milk. Um, but, and I think having talked to some of the people involved, I think, information from the website gives us a lot of and useful advice kind of an understanding dairy processing I often talk to students about this is the first few words careful herd management and more hygienic milking practices that the key to a good quality final product is the best possible quality raw material and I get the impression that the cows whose milk goes into this process are probably the best looked after cows if not in Australia and the world in terms of their hygienic quality so that's a, a very good uh, example of, of the principles of good processing and start off with good raw materials. So uh, I was fascinated by this. I, I found this a fascinating um, uh, uh, development. And I was in Australia, I've been lucky enough to visit a couple of times, uh, obviously not unfortunately in the last 18 months, but uh, I was there in 2018. I spent a couple of weeks in Australia and New Zealand on a sort of mini sabbatical. And one of my, one of my uh, uh, goals was to find cold pressed raw milk. And I was staying in, in um, uh, in Werribee, uh, just outside Melbourne, because I was kind of based around Victoria University and uh, SESIRO. And I did manage to find some cold pressed raw milk and brought it home to the apartment I was staying in and drank it, drank a whole bottle of it. It just felt quite pleased with myself. It was very rich, very creamy, very uh, uh, nice drinking experience. Uh, and I still have the empty bottle uh, on my desk in my office in the university. So I was particularly happy to get to after working on it for so long to actually get to drink the product that was made by that process. Uh, and, you know, there's been lots of other, here's a study from Ireland, so that's a lot of other countries, including Ireland, have taken note of what's gone on in Australia and are interested in this and, and found, you know, studies on the safety, shelf life and quality of raw milk. This is only from about two or three years ago. And finding, again, that high pressure processing uh, was giving, like, a total viable count. So it was giving significant reductions in a total viable counts. Um, uh, over storage is giving significant kill of E. coli of Listeria monocytogenes uh, and at a rate that was proportional to, to the pressure and, and the holding time. So it's still a very active area. As I say, it's not a pasteurization alternative as such. In a way, it's it's making a safer raw milk as opposed to an extended shelf life pasteurized milk. Uh, another area which we found fascinating to watch has been commercial applications for functional dairy products. I like Fonterra probably 10 years ago now at this stage, looking at, at uh, high value, low volume. I mean, because of nature, I pressure high value, low volume is an attractive solution. Like you look making colostrum for the, the um, Asian market making functional beverages and probiotic products and a lot of interesting and licensed technologies for making colostrum. Another area that's active for high pressure at the moment has been human, human milk. We've done some work at this in the UCC. A very valuable biological material, obviously, is, is human milk. And looking at, at the ability of high pressure processing to give, uh, uh, in, better applied in probably milk banks more than hospitals, but to give very good retention of key kind of uh, uh, biological biologically valuable components of human milk um, like lipase or lactoferrin and lysozyme that, that are much better here. You can see retention in the middle bar here, which is pasteurization. Like you get the raw milk levels here on the, the left-hand side and then pasteurization by holder or flash treatments or in many cases reducing the activity whereas technologies then it's comparing it to UV, but high pressure giving you very good retention of these biological activities. And it's pretty much the same idea as in the colostrum to, to give microbial confidence and safety confidence while retaining biological value. Okay, so I think that's another interesting space. But the problem remains as spores. Just the spore formers like Clostridia or Bacilli are, are heat resistant or pressure resistant. So typically we need to control the spores by other methods. And the two key methods are you either have to have a pH hurdle like you do in fruit juice to keep them down, or else you have to keep it refrigerated like you do with them. So, you know, high pressure on its own is so far not able to give us a kind of a canning equivalent. But the closest is that maybe the potential at future for <laughs> sterilization at lower temperatures, like talking about like heating it up at 80, 90 or 100 degrees and comparing them with, combining them with pressure and giving very good inactivation of clostridial spores. So instead of having to can at 100, 
10, 115, 120 degrees of the consequence um, impact for the nutritional and sensory quality, we can get the same effect of maybe less than 100 degrees combined with pressure. But these are really expensive. These are big machines, a lot of metal involved. The heating and cooling involved is, is something that I, I still don't think has been fully commercialized at this point, a high pressure sterilization machine that has been shown in principle in the lab. There's other work that's been going on for years. I, I don't know the point it's got to yet yeah, where you can kind of trick the bacteria by you heat them, you pressure treat them in a lower pressure and they kind of are tricked into germination and then you hit them with a higher pressure and you kill them. Uh, but I'm not sure again if that's been successfully turned into a process. Um, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about the dairy matrix, about the digestibility of milk systems, and, and a lot of studies on, on the, the in vivo digestibility and digestion and of proteins and absorption of nutrients from high pressure process dairy systems. And again, lots of studies showing no impact of high pressure and digestibility of milk compared to heat, despite all these impacts on milk proteins. So reassuring a lot of evidence showing that no negative impact on digestibility, which has been a huge focus. And like in, in some cases, this study I did with a colleague from the US a number of years ago, showing that the digestibility of beta lactulobulin is the key allergen. Uh, that that in the top in the control here, this band of electrophoresis gelus beta lactulobulin during digestion is remaining stubbornly persistent and so allergenic in a kind of an in vitro model of digestion. Whereas after high pressure treatment, we can see uh, it's disappearing much more quickly. So it's actually enhancing the digestibility of, of allergenic new proteins. So not only in, in some cases no negative, but also an, an actual uh, positive. You know, so the largest available batch systems are probably produced at least in the European context by a company called Hyperbaric in Spain with throughputs of, of uh, you know, about 3,000 kilos an hour. You know, with systems, it's a batch process, but a highly automated one with samples being loaded in in baskets and unloaded and a fairly uh, automated system. Um, post package systems uh, where these have been around for a while with some regulatory hurdles where if you're treating liquids instead of putting liquid into a bottle and treating the bottle as is probably happening with made by cow you can actually treat the liquid directly and then put, uh, package it treat, treat it directly with pumps or pistons to very high pressure uh, and there are systems now available from hyperbaric that'll go up to ten thousand liters an hour you know, so, you know, compared to a, a typical pasteurization of UHT, large scale planties, it's still pretty small scale, but they're heading in the right direction. But again, at, at, at very high cost. So just for the last couple of minutes, then to finish off and have some time for questions, I just want to talk for maybe 10 minutes about 3D printing. So it's been a fun thing we've worked on in, in recent years. Like the idea of mechanically layering or shaping a flowing substance, taking food and, and using it as essentially a, a low pressure, customizable um, uh, extrusion process, right? Uh, so you can shape anything that could flow that we can make layers and build up three dimensional layers, you know? Uh, and just been lots of interest in, in using meat in, in the high pressure process, uh, sorry, high pressure process again, make myself mixed up 3D printing, like uh, it meat into different shapes, uh, fruits, vegetables, pastes, candy, um, like uh, sugar-based chocolate. And we've done some work as I'll talk about briefly on cheese. And the whole idea is, you know, you can take raw materials, you can take food materials and you can combine them, shape them and produce them in new ways. And we can see the idea here in the lot right of, of a printer literally layering the food into to construct it. So we can deconstruct a food or take a, a set of raw materials. You can see the idea of printing a pizza essentially. But the whole point is it's computer controlled. So you start off in certain number of raw materials and you can combine them in essentially infinite different ways and the computer tells what shape to produce it in. and you can do 100 different ones in the same day you can customize you can personalize you can you can experiment you can prototype you can make structures and shapes that you might be able to do you can you can take food and like <laughs> one area where there's been quite a bit of research funding in europe is dysphagia for people with difficulty chewing and swallowing to, to take food and construct it in a way that that gives the nutritional and flavor uh, uh, that people will expect or need, but has a structure that's more digestible in terms of being able to chew it. So it's it's been a really interesting uh, uh, area of research for about the last 20 years. And I suppose one of the reasons we got interested in is like the basis, like 3D printing is all about building structures. It's all about building structures and like dairy pro products are really good at making structures. Proteins make structures. Proteins make cheese and they make yogurt. Fat makes butter. 
So dairy is inherently going to make the structures. So therefore, if we have a technology in which the key to it is trying to make structures, could we use dairy as a base for that? You know, and then, you know, and so there's been a lot of interest. Food companies are interested. I remember our first query was from a food company asking us, uh, can you 3D print cheese? And we were fascinated. We said, why are you interested in this? And they said, well, we don't see we'll ever be 3D printing cheese, but we think in the future people might be 3D printing and we want to know, can we sell those people cheese? Can, can we come up with a solution whereby they could use our cheese as a raw material in a domestic or a restaurant printer? Chefs, and a lot of this because of small scale is being done in, in restaurants. Customers uh, customizing their meals. And then the idea of an involved in projects, it's like a vending machine. You go up to a vending machine and you say, okay, today I want something that's chewy, that's raspberry flavored, that's rich in vitamin D and R. And you basically punch the buttons and the 3D printer will assemble a snack to do that. And that's the kind of thing, you know, you have a number of buckets of raw materials that have proteins, of lipids, of nutrients that it can combine in different ways. And uh, mass customized, like we've seen food companies like doing, does a great report of Pepsi using 3D printing to customize when they want to try a, a new shape of potato chip, like a crisp, that they have different sizes or shapes or ridges or depths of, of a, you know, a snack. They could make thousands of different possibilities for small scale testing to, to re rapidly prototype and get people to try things out. You know, uh, again, whether it's ever used in, in large scale industrially is probably a, a good and still a live question. You know, and, and lots of interest in first permanent 3D printed food restaurant in the Netherlands from a number of years ago by a chef called Jan Smink, uh, who, uh, using these printers by, from a company called Byflow. You know, 3D printing for prototype and packaging. Obviously, you know, it's it's originally used for plastics. So, you know, we could make uh, lots of different prototype packages or make small scale customized packages using food is another area that companies might be interested in. And then backing that up with a lot of research into materials you know, uh, looking at, at scientific studies, like a lot of work going on in Australia, Besh Bandari and Nidhi Bansal at the University of Queensland would be really, uh, have a really good group working in this. And here's a review of, from theirs, if people are interested in looking at 3D printing and, and a lot of different techniques, a lot of different principles, like traditional kind of extrusion and depositing it into layers, but there are also ways where you can like literally make a layer of powder and 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 construct something from powder, or use a laser to shape a particular type of, of food material. And then applications, chocolate, confectionery, meat, you know, like cellular bioprinting of meat, like the, or even kind of meat substitutes. Uh, like printing uh, plant proteins into meat structures. Lots of active work. Like here's another review from people we've worked at at VTT in Finland, like looking at combinations of starch and milk powder and looking at, okay, what are the and key kind of test materials that we use is like how do you design the, um, the, the how do you know how good it is at making and retaining a shape and the precision of the material. And you can see big differences in the ability of the material, some which failed entirely, some like here, some which gave really good, like that 60% same skin milk powder paste producing really fine lattice structures just as a test for can we make, can we use this like Lego to make a structure? You know, so we did a study uh, based on like, where you got from a company on, on the processed cheese. You know, can we characterize various printing properties of processed cheese? Uh, and we published a paper in 2018 and it got a lot of um, media interest. Uh, it, it was quite funny, like um, uh, went on social media and on Twitter and stuff. People are very amused at the idea that the Irish scientists were, were 3D printing cheese, you know, like um, and lots of kind of amusement in the in the, the the media, but at the same time, a lot of a lot of real interest. And I was in Australia at that time. I gave a number of talks on on three D printing at the time. It was is a real interest, but you know, it it drove the idea that dairy is a material for that has a potential for making uh, structures. So we've done a lot of work. My PhD student Megan Ross, this picture here, has been uh, just finishing up her thesis, working a lot on this. And like typically, we start off like one of the fun things about three D printing, at least as a research tool, was you start off with very cheap. You can buy a 3D printer online for about 100 or 200, probably about three or 400 Australian dollars, you can get a pretty good 3D printer. Usually you don't, but if you Google cheese printer, you won't find it, you find a plastic printer. And you have to then kind of um, um, 
and customize it and, and build your own printer. You literally use it to print the parts to make your printer. It's like self-replicating technology, which is great fun as a research tool. You know, and we've got a motor and a shaft, which has basically got our material is in here in the syringe, which is insulated so it can temperature control it. And it's being extruded by pushing down this, this plunger to push out the material into the shape that we want. Uh, so, you know, you take your raw materials. We were looking at, at you know, just off for five minutes and then finishing this. Like raw materials for processed cheese, we mix them together and heat them. And then we cool them to about 65 degrees when they're in a kind of a good emulsion structure and put them into syringe. At the same time, we design a structure using CAD, you know, the shape we want to make. The structure basically makes this into a set of the computers, makes this into a set of kind of computer instructions of the layers it needs to print. And it sets the printing parameters like uh, the speed and the time and the shape. And basically it tells the, the syringe where to go. And the 3D dimensions are it's going uh, enough it's going to work at the video clip but no it's not working but it kind of goes left and right or uh, back and forth and up and down and there are three dimensions you know and we did a lot of work to realistically characterize different combinations of, of ph of our processed cheese of combinations of young and mature cheese and kind of comparing this to syringeability and printability properties and kind of identifying a, a kind of a key window of ideal viscosity because we want material if it flows too much uh, it's just going to basically squirt out of the syringe and make a mess. If it doesn't flow at all, it won't come out of the syringe. So you have to find the kind of the sweet spot where it kind of flows out of the syringe in a controlled way. And yet once it hits, once it decelerates by hitting the, the print bed, it kind of builds up. And then use computer kind of software to, to analyze the precision of the print. We tell it to print a grid and then we see, well, how good did it do? How close did it get to printing that grid? You know, and you can see like if you put a lot, a lot of young cheese into the into the mixture, it's it's spread, it's too low viscosity, it's just a blob basically. Whereas we're getting better here. If we put some mature cheddar in, put quite a bit of mature cheddar, we can get a much better, more precise structure being built. You know, and then we can kind of combine that with studying it under a microscope to to try and understand, okay, what's it doing to the structure? What's it doing to the protein matrix? What is it doing to the, because it's kind of a combination of heat and shear, it's kind of shear, relatively low shear. And how does it impact in the structure? So, and in parallel, my student has been doing, because obviously the question is, okay, you know, it's easy in a, in a, like, I suppose, it, you know, it's easy to sit in a lab and, and do things and have fun with, with printing, and it really is a fun thing to work with. But like, I mean, the two things you have to look at it beside that are, Who's going to use it? Okay, it's just going to be like in the future, are people going to have 3D printers in their home, in their kitchen, beside their microwave and their Nespresso machine that they can play with? You know, uh, is it going to be a vending machine? Is it going to be in a gym where people can make snacks? Is it going to be in a railway station where people, commuters can make snacks? Uh, you know, is it going to be in a restaurant? And we've seen variations of all of those. You know, probably least likely is it going to be in a, in a company. But, you know, so, uh, but so, uh, the questions are, you know, what can we do with it? Who's going to use it? And then, of course, the key question is, well, will anybody want it? So part of my students' PhD was like looking at, at consumer views and working with social scientists to look at consumer views. We could focus groups of 24 consumers to investigate perceptions of Irish consumers towards 3D printing applications and looking at how they would uh, accept in different contexts. So, you know, we found that things like fitness centres and gyms were much more acceptable, interestingly, than, than restaurants, public spaces. Uh, and what we did was we used our focus group to, to design a study that we could really uh, dive into people's understanding of and perceptions of 3D printing and did a study with a, an online survey company of a thousand Irish adults. It was actually benchmarked against a thousand done in Finland as well, through a collaboration we have with VTT in Finland, to establish kind of themes, which are most significant determinations of the willingness to, to buy and try 3D foods. And key factors like is trust in science, neophobia, which is kind of a, a kind of psychological reticence to try new food experience and perceived irrelevance are all great predictors of intention to use 3D food printing technology. And, and again, we could have a whole seminar on this alone on consumer views of 3D printing. But I suppose the reason I mentioned it was just to point out that obviously it's really important that we know that what consumers want. Because as we said right at the start, consumer views can sometimes be counterintuitive or, or from a scientific viewpoint can can you know seem to go against their interest, like comparing uh, pasteurization UHT. But yet at the end of the day, if consumers don't want it, 
it's game over. It doesn't matter how scientifically good it is if consumers don't want. And that's just, I guess, the key point is consumers have to be part of the picture all along and to think about all of this. So, and finally, you know, uh, food processing continues to evolve, driven by multiple factors. It's it's an area of active research. Lots of food scientists fascinated by these areas, but, you know, transfer to industry practice, we saw it took a long time at high pressure. Well, 10 years of intense research before the first products came out. Done. And challenges remain cost, scale, regulation, like we saw the regulation issue around high pressure on it. And the competition with, with existing technologies, what's the advantage that makes the disadvantage just go away? Uh, and, you know, of the technologies, I think the great success story, and particularly, you know, watching over the, the years has been in, in countries like Australia with high pressure. So uh, thank you all for your attention. I uh, hope you found that useful and interesting. I'm happy to I'll have a look now at the chat and see if you have any questions. And thanks once again to Dairy Australia and the University of Melbourne and Jenny in particular for the invitation and for setting up everything up today. Now, I shall uh, breathe and have a look at the chat. Let's see some questions are coming in here. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to take a, a, a drink of water. Yeah, thanks very much, Alan. There's a lot to take in there and um, a lot to cover in an hour, wasn't there? But, yeah, um, yeah fantastic information. So a couple of things there. Okay, so the, and thanks very much, Jenny. I see questions here. Uh, 3D printing sounds like a nice to have rather than an essential method of pro processing dairy. Do you envisage any essential roles for an industry? That's a really good, and it's 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 the immediate you know question a lot of people ask. And I'll quote a guy who I gave a talk on this at an International Dairy Federation Congress in Belfast a few years ago, and I spoke. Uh, in the same session as a professor from Massey, Richard Archer, I think it was from Massey University, who spoke about 3D printing. And he get, said something that I always quote him on. He said, even in the future, if 1% if of food is 3D printed, he said, that's still a lot of food. He said, nobody's going to claim this is going to be a, a large scale technology. It's going to be a niche. It's going to be applied maybe in in some restaurants, maybe there'll be some kind of experimental home chefs who might use it. You know, maybe there's it's going to be used in industry not to make products, but to do prototyping and to do kind of test marketing on, on different versions of products before they then decide, okay, this is the type of crisp we want to make. Now we, we make it by conventional means. So it's kind of niche applications. But for those niches, it's, it's the same with high pressure. It's finding a niche where it has an advantage that something else doesn't. And with with um, with three D printing, it's it's the the customizability and the personalizability and the flexibility. It's all based on a computer program. Instead of having ten different nozzles or dies in your extruder, you just have one printer and you can make whatever shapes you want. So it it I don't know about essential, but I think it will find and is finding useful niches. Uh, cleanability is is left consumers, and that's I, and it's uh, thanks Ian. Uh, the question is if I wonder about cleanability of three D is left, and that's absolutely going to be a question from the start. You know, uh, like what materials you can make it of, whether you can have very washable. Like you either if you have a home printer, you have, you have two solutions. You've either got you know your your you've got a kind of chamber that you're filling with food that has to be taken out and washed. Uh, properly in a good clean, you know, like stainless steel material or something like that, or else you've got like, like an analogy that's often used is I'm sure people are familiar with it in Australia, the Nespresso machine type is capsules. You know, you're putting capsules into the and they're, they're disposable capsules and hopefully with recycling materials, etc. So it's absolutely really important point. Uh, Shane has asked. A uh, very uh, interesting presentation. Thanks, Shane. What effect does high pressure have on minor proteins like lactoferrin? And that's one a really good question. And lactoferrin is a really good good kind of case study because you know uh, in things like the the colostrum studies and things like the human milk studies, uh, one that's been studied quite a bit is is proteins like lactoferrin, and generally finding that they're more resistant to pressure than they are to heat. So one of the kind of again research requirements for pressure is that you know is you can't assume that something that happens with heat transfers to pressure like pressure denatures beta lactalbumin for example as does heat but alpha lactalbumin is much more resistant to pressure than it is to heat likewise with lactoferrin like um it tends to be more resistant to pressure than to heat so whereas if you had a heat treatment and a pressure treatment to give you the same microbial kill the amount of Excuse me, of lactoferrin that's left intact or left native 
after the pressure treatment would be a lot higher. And that's where the value for something where you're relying on the biological function, like like, like colostrum perhaps, or human milk, why it gives it, gives it uh, a relevance. Uh, I'm just trying to see, I don't see any more questions, but uh, I, I'm happy to take any, any others. Do you envisage synthetic dairy products being created through 3D printing? That's thanks, uh, Jenny. I think that's a really interesting question, uh, and I guess it's it's uh, it depends <laughs> it depends what you define as a synthetic dairy product. If you picture like the way an analogy I often use for dairy products on 3D printing is is like uh, my student Megan. Some of the work we didn't talk about has been using like milk proteins like my my cellar case and concentrate to build structures, because I always think high pressure as uh, 3D printing, it's like building a house and, um, uh, you know, you need bricks, right? And you need something to build structure. And 3D uh, dairy, as I said, is really good at giving us bricks to make structures, whether it be proteins or fats. So, you know, we can make a structure, a bland, they also tend to be bland flavored. So we can make a, a structure and a shape, a synthetic product using uh, milk proteins. But then, like a house, the bricks is on your first step, and then you decorate it how you want. You you paint it, you make it look the way you want. The analogy for food product is you 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 add whatever flavors and nutrients on top of your dairy kind of matrix, on top of your dairy structure. So that's one way. The other, maybe what you meant by synthetic was like dairy alternatives. You know, these kind of fake milks, like you know, uh, plant based milks or. Um, uh, cellular milks and there's no doubt there are people looking at this like could you use 3d printing to make a cheese substitute using plant proteins or to make a, a cheese substitute using kind of uh, cellular fermentation produced dairy proteins and i think definitely this is an area people are looking at because it's 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 a technology that's that's designed for being able to make structures mm -hmm. uh, so i think yeah Okay, well, thank you very much. Our time is up now. So um, with that, I'll stop the recording. But thank you, Ellen. Um, fantastic webinar. Thanks and very much. Lots to think about.